Good morning from Miami Beach, the home of Neurosurgical TV. Uh, I have the honor of introducing a, a series, introducing actually the second week of the Art of Brain Surgery Masterclass with James Leo of Rutgers in New Jersey. Uh, and I'm going to turn it over to Andrea Castillo, a neurosurgeon that's doing a fellowship with James currently. Welcome, Andrea. Hello, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for being here on our second series of the Art of Brain of Surgery, a master class. Uh, today, we have the great honor to be with Dr. James K. Liu, Professor Director of Cerebrovascular and Skull Vase and Pituitary Surgery, uh, Co-Director of Endoscopic Skull Vase Surgery Program, Department of Neurosurgery of Roger University and New Jersey, USA. Today, the team is mastering the temporal bone for lateral skull vase approaches to several pontine angle and petrochival lesions. Thank you very much, Dr. Liu, for giving us this amazing lecture. Great. Thank you, Andrea, for that kind introduction. Uh, without further ado, let me go ahead and share my screen. Okay, can everyone see my screen? Yes, perfect. Okay, terrific. Well, uh, thank you. It's a great honor to be presenting this series in the Art of Brain Surgery Masterclass. And today I wanted to focus on lateral skull base approaches, particularly for CP angle lesions and uh, petroclival lesions. And the type of pathologies we see in our center vary across the spectrum. And, and here's a variety of different complex lesions, epidermoids, schwannomas, paragangliomas, acoustic neuromas, uh, and uh, skull-based meningiomas. And uh, these can be quite challenging because they often involve a variety of cranial nerves, brainstem compression, and vascular structures. And you need to know all approaches in your armamentarium because you never know in some instances you're going to require more advanced skull base approaches to adequately treat these lesions. Of course, our workhorse is the retrosigmoid approach. This is the most common approach that we're very familiar with, very simple to do, gives you great access to the CP angle, and, and we can see all the cranial nerves from the fourth nerve, from the tentorium down to the jugular foramen, uh, to the lower cranial nerves. And so this is a, a standard lesion we would use for a retrosigmoid. This is a petrotentorial meningioma. Uh, I like to do these in the Fukushima lateral position with a C-shaped incision. And um, it's a simple retrosigmoid craniotomy here behind the uh, sigmoid sinus. And for a lesion like this, you want to look for the petrotentorial junction much like you would do for a microvascular decompression. And here we're drilling off the supramiatal tubercle. Oftentimes these tubercles located just above the IAC can be in your way and be hyperostotic. So simple drilling it down, give you better access, more anterior viewing trajectory, gets you adequate exposure to the tumor. We then uh, devascularize the tumor uh, at its blood supply at the tentorium and the petrus dura, and then we debulk it centrally, and then we can come around it extracapsularly, peeling it away from the surface of the brainstem. So here you're seeing the seventh and eighth nerves right here. This is the seventh and eighth nerves. And then anteriorly is the fifth nerve. Now remember the fifth nerve is located superiorly, but more anteriorly, but in this case, the nerve is pushed inferiorly to the same level as the seven and eight nerves, which tells you that this tumor is from the tentorial origin, so that when it grows, it's pushing the fifth nerve downwards towards the seventh nerve. And this is the final view. You can see here's the sixth nerve. Here's the basilar artery, uh, probably a branch of aica. These are the lower cranial nerves, 9, 10, and 11. And then the fourth nerve and SCA up by the tentorium. And we'll do a watertight closure and put a little fat graft for closure. And uh, this really helps seals off the CSF leak. And she did quite well uh, and was uh, neurologically intact afterwards. The retrosigmoid approach is also the workhorse for 
when we do our vast majority of acoustic neuromas in our center. Roughly about 80% of these are treated retrosigmoid, and roughly 20% we treat translab. But there's the ninth and 10th nerves. And the technique I want to demonstrate that we've been doing for acoustic neuromas is called the subperineural dissection technique. And the idea is that we pick up a layer of the vestibular nerve and we peel it away from the tumor capsule. The concept is that this vestibular nerve ensheaths the entire schwannoma. And if you maintain this plane of dissection circumferentially, this layer of the perineurium will protect the brainstem ventrally and also protect the facial nerve and the cochlear nerves anteriorly. So we've identified the fifth nerve here superiorly. We're working on the superior part of the tumor. And I'm going to work my way back and pick up the superior vestibular nerve branch. And I'm able to find this perineurium, which is this veil of membrane that's covering the seventh nerve. So notice how the seventh nerve is floating anterior to this membrane. I'm not directly dissecting on the seventh nerve. I have a layer of protection, which is this veil of perineurium. I keep this membrane intact and then I'm able to deglove it, deglove the tumor, undress the tumor by peeling off this membrane and protecting the seventh nerve. And I can tell you the seventh nerve is not undergoing any EMG activity. It's been relatively quiet through the whole case. And when I come across any tumor adhesion uh, adherent to the membrane here that you see, I'll leave this membrane attached and I'll thin it down to the thinnest volume possible. And since this was right on the facial nerve, I could stimulate it. I left a tiny little piece to get a radical near total resection. You could see the facial nerve is intact. This is him in the recovery room, House Brackman, grade one. And here's nine months post-op. So an excellent uh, clinical result for this patient. Like I said, we've been doing translab in roughly 20% of our cases, and we can apply the same concept of this subperineural technique. I'll demonstrate uh, this was a cystic schwannoma. These can be a little bit more challenging. Uh, sometimes they're more adherent to the facial nerve, uh, but in some cases, the cystic schwannomas can also be a little bit more hypervascular. In this instance, it was not hypervascular, but you could see it was quite adherent to the brainstem. And we're using uh, fine microdissection with sharp dissection to lyse the adhesions from uh, the um, adhesive margins. And we'll go ahead and we're going to carefully peel off the tumor off the facial nerve. So this is the facial nerve that you see here. We're gonna to try to pick up that uh, subperineural membrane. And then here's the facial nerve at the distal IAC. And then we're using a Roten-3 disc dissector to push away this perineural membrane away from the tumor capsule. And we can sharply dissect the adhesions using very good, fine, sharp dissection to lyse the uh, uh, perineural adhesions to the membrane. And then coming down near the porous acousticus and, and relatively just distal to the porous is roughly where most of the tumor becomes uh, very adherent to the uh, facial nerve region. And so it's important to continue to debulk the tumor uh, so that you can collapse the tumor and come, come around it circumferentially. And this is where the point of the uh, most adherent portion of the tumor is. So I'm going to sharply just incise it. You could see I'm leaving a tiny little remnant, a tiny little uh, residue right on the perineural membrane. But I'm using scissors to create this plane. And I know that I'm going to leave a, a tiny, tiny residue. But I will show you that it's not even visible on the MRI scan, but I'm doing this in order to save the facial nerve. And, and this is a technique in order to maximize your tumor resection, but also to maximize your facial nerve outcome. So we're stimulating the nerve and it stimulates at 0.05 milliamps. 
This is the closure technique I use, which is called a fascial sling technique, using a fascia lata to create a sling to hold the fat graft. And uh, this is him uh, post-op, uh, House Brackman grade one, a radical near total. And, and these are our combinations of uh, gross and near total. You could see uh, radiographically insignificant, whether you do a radical near total or gross total, but the outcome is a facial nerve, Brackman one. And then for these large tumors, this we did retrosigmoid, but these two on the right, we did translab because of the degree of compression and how much um, uh, of the long axis of the tumor you see going towards the brainstem. So in these cases, I prefer a translab because there's less cerebellar retraction. You come at this angle, and of course, uh, we're able to get an excellent facial nerve result. So when do we reach the limits of the retrosigmoid? When are the instances where our workhorse becomes a limit and we need to consider more advanced transpetrous, transpetrosal approaches. Look at this example of a giant epidermoid tumor. This is a 43-year-old with gait ataxia. And you can see the vast majority of uh, epidermoids we treat with retrosigmoid in the CP angle. But what about this component that wraps around the cerebellum and lodges into the brainstem at this juncture? Can you get to it adequately with a retrosigmoid? And so this was the dilemma. Uh, so what I ended up choosing was I did a retrosigmoid, but I extended it to include the frame and magnum. So it was a combined far lateral retrosigmoid. And you could see I'm able to get down to the lower cranial nerves and control the lower cranial nerves. I'm able to control nine and 10. I was able to get seven, but seven and eight here was always under irritation. No matter how gentle I was with the cerebellum, the seven and eight was under a lot of traction and my window was limited. So it was hard for me to look around the corner of this cerebellum, even with an endoscope. And um, this is something you should be aware of. I encountered this uh, uh, unfortunate complication. You could see this is a nerve uh, that was uh, cut in the process of removing the epidermoid. This is the sixth nerve. And fortunately, I was able to find the other end of the sixth nerve. And this is important because this is a complication that you can restore, you can recover from. So I found both ends of the nerve and uh, most people would just glue it together. Um, but I don't think that's a, the best method. I'm always afraid that the wave of the CSF will push the nerve ends and wash them apart. So uh, one single suture can be adequate. So we're using a 10 nylon suture and we're going ahead and do a direct nerve repair of the sixth nerve. You can see the sixth nerve here is very elongated and uh, just a simple suture with uh, three knots is adequate. And then I'm going to rest the nerve on the Petra's bone and then put a little fibrin glue on it so it doesn't wash away. I use an endoscope to look around. You could see there's some residual tumor around the corner of the cerebellum that I cannot see. But for the most part, the brain stem's been adequately decompressed. And as I expected, you could see the residual tumor was in this blind spot that I could not see with the retrosigmoid approach. And fortunately, you could see at four months, there's some partial recovery of the sixth nerve palsy. And then at seven months, to my surprise, the sixth nerve palsy was completely resolved. I thought it would take a full 12 months, but at six months, it was already completely uh, resolved. However, at nine months, the tumor started to grow. And so now I'm reached with this dilemma of which approach is best to get to this area that I had so much trouble visualizing with a retrosigmoid approach. And so the idea here is to come at this angle. And in order to come at this angle, this is done through a Kawasi's approach where you come from the middle fossa, you drill off the Petrus apex, and I extended it to include a, a mini, mini petrosal. I call this the extended Kawasi where I drill off just a little bit of the uh, pre-sigmoid dura to extend my dural incision. 
And you have to uh, watch out for vein of LeBay, preserve the vein of LeBay. Here's the fourth nerve coming into the tentorium. We'll open up the tentorium and I can look right on the superior surfaces of the cerebellum. And you can see there's the epidermoid tumor that I was not able to see. And so from this angle, I'm able to look backwards on the brainstem and get to this tumor that's lodged right here at seven and eight. This is the area of the blind spot that I could not see. And that I can remove the tumor here, control seven and eight, and have a beautiful view of the sixth nerve, the basilar artery. And then superiorly, I have the fifth nerve and the fourth nerve going into the tentorium. So this is the alternate approach to get to the areas of where the retrosigmoid was not able to show me. Here's another example. This is a, a petrotentorial meningioma, a lot of brainstem compression. Uh, at first glance, I thought retrosigmoid approach, no problem, right? And then as I looked at the film more carefully, I was concerned about this most superior portion of the mesencephalon cut. You could see this tumor goes just beyond the tentorium. The SCA is wrapped around here, and I'm worried about the fourth nerve, whether I can control the fourth nerve. So my approach was to do a retrosigmoid, but if I needed to, I could extend the approach as necessary if I needed to get more subtemporal exposure. So I initially started with a retrosigmoid. You could see we're doing a supramiatal drilling. There's a little hyperostatic supramiatal tubercle. And we start at the petrotentorial junction, just like you saw in the other case. This is a, a superior petrosal vein, which I eventually divided so I can mobilize the cerebellum and get uh, supracerebellar exposure. And so the initial portion is debulking the tumor. And as we debulk the tumor, we come around it extracapsularly. And uh, the important thing here is to undress the arachnoid from the tumor capsule. And uh, we're peeling it away from the SCA vessel here. We're looking here now in the supracerebellar corridor. We wanna look for the fourth nerve, which will be wrapped around the backside here. And you'll see this in a moment. This is a glimpse of the fourth nerve behind the arachnoid. And a lot of times these tumors, the fourth nerve is pushed more medially and upwards. And then here we are dissecting the tumor off of the back of the brainstem. And this is the, uh, the seventh and eighth nerves here. We're working above seven and eight. And this is the fifth nerve, just like the previous case. The fifth nerve you could see is pushed downwards towards seven and eight. We'll drill off more of the supramiatal tubercle to get better access and then continue to work on the tumor here. More debulking with the ultrasonic aspirator. And here we're starting to reach our limits. We're getting very close to the end and I'm having trouble controlling the fourth nerve. The fourth nerve is located way up here above the tentorium, and the tumor was quite adherent, and I, I didn't feel safe pulling this tumor down with a hook without really seeing the fourth nerve, and I didn't want to leave this residual tumor here on a young lady. She was uh, in her 40s, um, and I didn't want to leave this residual, so I converted to a subtemporal transtentorial approach. Um, I was going to uh, uh, do a transpetrosal, but she had a very large uh, superior petrosal sinus, and I was worried about the dominant side. So I simply did a subtemporal transtentorial. You could see I'm making an incision in the tentorium. And then here's the fourth nerve. You could see the tumor is was very adherent and wrapped around the fourth nerve. And I, if I had con continued with a retrosigmoid, I think I would have damaged the fourth nerve and given her a, a, a permanent fourth nerve palsy. But here we were able to dissect the tumor away. You could see the tumor is actually uh, adherent to the uh, tentorial uh, entrance. And then we were able to get a gross total removal and uh, save the fourth nerve that you see down here. And we got a complete removal 
and she was neurologically intact. So uh, an excellent result for this young woman. So with those two examples of our limits of the retrosigmoid, um, we have to know the other approaches. And, and I'm going to go over some of these variations. This is the anterior patrolsal and posterior patrolsal and combined patrolsal. Um, I'm going to save the far lateral and transjugular approaches for another talk. This will be focused more on the craniocervical junction. But when we think about the temporal bone, I like to think of ourselves as archaeologists or like a sculptor like Michelangelo. And this is the, the famous statue of David that you're all familiar with. And if you've ever been to Florence, Italy, you'll you'll see that he's Michelangelo has some unfinished works. And, and these are quite remarkable because what you're seeing here is his vision, his vision of the, the final product that's hidden in the bone. And so when we're drilling the temporal bone, we have to have the same mindset of, of visualizing these structures that are deep within the bone, and we're going to excavate them out like much like an archaeologist, much like the, what you see here uh, at Petra in Jordan. So how do we conquer the rock, so to speak? When we look at these um, transpetrous approaches, I like to divide the clivus into four zones. The upper fourth is generally the dorsum cellae down to where the fifth nerve is. And this can be reached primarily through subtemporal or FTOZ approaches. The Kawasis approach is great for the zone between the fifth and the seventh nerves. And then if you add a posterior patrosal, you can get below the seventh nerve towards the jugular foramen. And the lower fourth is generally the far lateral transcondylar approach. And of course, the retrosigmoid is the workhorse that gives us a more uh, panoramic exposure. And in some instances, you may want to consider endoscopic endonasal, transclival for medial uh, appointing lesions. But I really think that these transpatrosal approaches remain important in our armamentarium, and, and you can use them for both vascular and neoplastic lesions. And when we divide them um, into different zones, um, we, we classify them into anterior patrosal or posterior patrosal. The anterior patrosal is a middle fossa exposure. We drill off the petrous apex, uh, popularized by Professor Kawase. And the posterior patrosal approach is coming in pre-sigmoid with a temporal craniotomy and um, a retrolabyrinthine pretrosectomy. And I'll go over the variations of the different petrosectomies later on in this talk. But let's start with the anterior patrosal. This is the middle fossa exposure that gets you to the brainstem between the fifth and the seventh nerves. And it really is helpful for petrous apex lesions, uh, brainstem cavernomas between the fifth and the seventh nerves. And it really helps you get into Meckel's cave. And I really like this approach when you have these dumbbell lesions that go into Meckel's cave, you can open Meckel's cave quite easily by opening the fibrous ring of the porous trigeminus. And it also gives you this look back view on the brainstem. And, and this is the, uh, what I showed you earlier, where I had that residual tumor on the brainstem, which I couldn't see with the retrosigmoid, but I could easily see with the Kawasis approach. We can combine the Kawasis approach with other approaches and so when we position the patient, this is very important when I tell the residents that when you're positioning the head, you don't want to position it lateral uh, because when you're looking down at the petrous apex as a surgeon, the petrous apex is far away from you. But if you rotate the head so that it is roughly 20 to 30 degrees from horizontal, the petrous ridge is parallel to the floor. So when you're looking down and drilling the petrous apex, it's much closer to you and anatomically uh, uh, more uh, ergonomic. We typically will use a frontotemporal incision with interfascial incision to protect the frontalis branch. And as an option, you can do a, a drop down zygomatic osteotomy to get the muscle uh, much lower. Uh, I generally don't do this uh, uh, routinely anymore. Uh, you can get adequate exposure without a zygomatic osteotomy. Nevertheless, the, the exposure that you really need to understand is the middle fossa Fukushima rhomboid. 
And this rhomboid structure is bordered by V3, GSPN, uh, RQ at eminence, and the medial petrous ridge. And once you understand these landmarks, you'll understand how to navigate the middle fossa and understand where the IAC and the cochlea are located. So in this cadaver, we've ligated the frame and spinosum, and we peeled off the dura propria to expose uh, V2 and V3, and we've exposed GSPN. And here is the rhomboid structure. This is V3, GSPN, RQ at eminence, and medial petrous ridge. In blue, this is Glasscox triangle. And when we bisect the angle here at the geniculate ganglion, this is roughly where the IAC will be. And anteromedial to this will be the cochlea. So when we drill, we have this X-ray vision of where the cochlea and the IAC and the carotid are located. And so we can then uncover and excavate these structures without injuring them. We leave roughly four to five millimeters of bone right over the cochlea. And we look for the fold of the dural of the IAC and we can follow it from medial to distal. And anteromedial here is the clivus. We can mobilize the V3 anteriorly, and you can see this is the true petrous apex, that's retrogasarian. We can drill off the rest of the petrous apex and maximize our exposure. And in some instances, such as some extensive chondrosarcomas, you can divide the GSPN and mobilize the carotid and get to the bone that's below the, um, the carotid. Um, and we published uh, our anatomic uh, study on this uh, some years ago. Uh, this was when I was a, a resident with Dr. Caldwell. And um, our idea was to try to how to maximize this Petra segment to do this Petrus to supraclinoid uh, Fukushima bypass, which is uh, rarely used these days due to uh, pipeline technology, but still an important, um, important thing to remember. Um, in some cases. So when we open the dura, we go subtemporally, and then we cut the tentorium, ligate the superior patrol sinus, and extend the dural incision into the posterior fossa dura. This, would, this is what allows you to expose uh, the posterior fossa elements and the brainstem. And this is what you see in the cadaver between the fifth and the seventh nerves. And in some instances, you can expose the sixth nerve as it goes into Dorello's canal. And so here's an example of the Kawasi's approach. This was a upper petroclival meningioma. You can see there's a supra and infratentorial component. Uh, it's a true petroclival meningioma because it's located medial to the fifth nerve and it's compressing the brain stem. So we do a, a frontotemporal incision and you'll see here in a moment, we initially start by dividing the middle meningeal artery right at the base of the middle fossa extradurally. And once we divide it, we can peel the dura propria from posterior to anterior. And we look for GSPN going into the facial hiatus. And as you go from posterior to anterior, there will be a layer of periosteum right over the GSPN. Oftentimes you're gonna require sharp dissection uh, either with a feather blade or micro scissors, you want to be able to cut this periosteum that's adherent that you see here that's tethering the temporal lobe dura to V3 and GSPN. So we'll use some sharp dissection here to lyse these fibrous periosteal adhesions, and then you can now mobilize the temporal lobe away from V3. I like to uncover and decompress the foramen ovale. This allows you to mobilize V3 anteriorly to get uh, maximal exposure of the middle fossa rhomboid. And, and here's the borders of the rhomboid. You can see the uh, V3 GSPN, and you know where the IAC is now. So we can begin our petrosectomy using a high-speed diamond drill with copious irrigation. You wanna start from medial to lateral. You can drill under the gasserian ganglion, and once you find the dura, the rest is easy. Once you find the dura, you can follow the dural curve towards the IAC and just be aware of where the horizontal carotid is. So you might want to skeletonize that early on to identify its location. 
So we've come subtemporally now to access the subtemporal portion of the tumor. You can see it's hinged right on the tentorium. And so we'll mobilize the tumor off of the brainstem here. And then we'll continue to debulk uh, this tumor up to the tentorium. And here's the fourth nerve. You saw the fourth nerve that was entering here. So we know where the fourth nerve is now. So we're going to cut the tentorium uh, from lateral to medial. This is the superior petrosal sinus. So we'll ligate the superior petrosal sinus here with a bipolar. You can alternatively use clips or a suture ligature, uh, but sometimes you can just close it down with a bipolar. And we'll open up the posterior fossa dura over the Kawasi's triangle that we drilled, and then we can finish the tentorium cut, finish extending the posterior fossa dural incision, and then open up the arachnoid. This is the uh, dandy's vein. This is the superior petrosal vein. I'm going to coagulate it and divide it here to get better access, but preserve the wishbone of the uh, on passage vein. And then this is the key component. I can follow the fifth nerve and then follow it into Meckel's cave and open up the fibrous ring. Here's the fifth nerve going into Meckel's cave. And look at the short distance I have to Meckel's cave. And the major advantage of the Kawasi's approach is that I can land anterior to the fifth nerve. This area right here is difficult to see retrosigmoid. Often the dissection in this pocket is blind. But from a Kawasi's approach, I'm looking straight in front of the fifth nerve. I have this beautiful view of this portion of the tumor that's medial to fifth nerve. And I don't have any uh, um, manipulation of the cerebellum, no traction, retraction on the cerebellum that can cause hearing loss. Uh, I'm well away, aware, uh, well away from the seventh and eighth, and I'm addressing the arachnoid here from the tumor capsule to free it up and then finally remove it. Here's the basilar artery. Here's the brainstem with the arachnoid over the brainstem intact. Here's the fifth nerve, and we'll do a multi-layered repair with uh, uh, duragen, a little bit of fat graft, and I like to harvest a vascularized pedicled pericranial flap, temporal parietal fascial flap that's usually pedicled posteriorly. And then I could rotate this into the skull base defect to get a nice vascularized repair. And here's the post-op scan, a complete removal, and this patient was neurologically intact. This here is a dumbbell schwannoma of the fifth nerve. You can see it's got a CP angle component, but it goes well into Meckel's cave. Can you do this through a retrosigmoid? Possibly, but uh, I think here I decided to do a Kawasi's approach because of my access to Meckel's cave. Here I did the transzygomatic variant, but here you'll see we'll do the same approach. Kawasi's on the right side, subtemporal middle fossa drilling of the Petrus apex, high speed diamond drill, find the dura over the IAC find the horizontal petrus carotid. And here we've opened up the dura and the posterior fossa, cut the tentorium subtemporally into the free edge of the incisura. And then you'll see here, we're opening up Meckel's cave by opening up the fibrous ring. And here's the fifth nerve. You can see the fifth nerve is here. This is the back of the tumor right over the cerebellum. And then we'll start to debulk the tumor here with an ultrasonic aspirator. And then here's seven and eight. Look how we're right in front of seven and eight. Here's the fifth nerve going in. And when you're doing trigeminal schwannoma surgery, you want to preserve as many of the fascicles as possible to minimize and avoid any facial dysthesias. Here we're preserving the root of the fifth nerve. We're staying right on the tumor capsule. And wherever the small fat fascicles that appear to be arising from the tumor, we'll divide them sharply, but preserve the main trunk. And we're able to define a plane here and remove the rest of the tumor and preserve this main trunk of the trigeminal nerve. Here's the brainstem nicely decompressed. You could see the fifth nerve uh, completely uh, preserved here.
And this is a complete removal. Patient was neurologically intact and had just very minimal V2 numbness and has been stable for almost 10 years. Uh, this is a case I did recently. This was a, a lesion that was compressing the brainstem. You could see it's medial to the fifth nerve. It didn't enhance much, uh, but this turned out to be an intradural chordoma. Unfortunately, this was uh, invading the surface of the brainstem. And so I was able to get a radical near total removal. There was a little microscopic residue right on the surface of the brainstem. Uh, but but over, nevertheless, a, a very good result. This is a case where a uh, patient had previous thoracic clear cell meningioma, and then years later developed this lesion that was growing uh, into Meckel's cave, and then it was extending out into the CP angle. And um, she had seen various opinions, which uh, other people had recommended gamma knife. And other people told her this was a cavernous sinus lesion, which I disagreed with. You can see this is not cavernous sinus. This is Meckel's cave. Cavernous sinus is this compartment anterior to it. So you have to recognize the difference between cavernous sinus and Meckel's cave because it's a big difference. Meckel's cave is much easier to remove. Uh, there's no much less cranial nerve morbidity. And so here we'll do this through Kawasi's approach, like I showed you. Peeling off of the middle fossa dura, drilling the petrous apex. And then we'll open up the dura uh, subtemporally. We want to find the free edge. Open up the posterior fossa dura in Kawasi's triangle. And then we'll coagulate the superior petrosal sinus, which will then allow us to cut the tentorium to the free edge. And we always want to look for the fourth nerve. So here's the fourth nerve. You want to cut behind the entrance of the fourth nerve so you don't injure the fourth nerve. This is where it's entering, so you cut behind it. There's the fourth nerve. And then we're going to open up Meckel's cave. So here's the tumor going into Meckel's cave. And now we have the complete panoramic exposure of the tumor. Complete exposure. And initially, I thought this was a trigeminal schwannoma, but interestingly, this ended up to be meningioma. But here we're going to debulk the tumor. And just like a trigeminal schwannoma, I'm going to preserve as many of these fascicles of the fifth nerve as possible. We'll carefully dissect right on the tumor capsule. We'll undress the tumor by peeling off these small fascicles. And then debulk the tumor in a piecemeal fashion so that we don't avulse any of the nerves. Here you can see I'm using scissors to peel off and spread and, and preserve these small fascicles. And then once it's completely freed, you can see the fifth nerve is completely intact. Fourth nerve is intact here. And uh, we'll do our repair. So here's the, the reconstruction. And you'll see the petrous uh, apex defect where we drilled, preserving the cochlea and a complete removal and she was neurologically intact. Now, this turned out to be clear cell meningioma. Understand that this is a grade two atypical meningioma, which tend to be more aggressive. So in these cases, I favor additional radiotherapy. But you would not have known this if this was simply gamma knifed without tissue pathology. So it may have, been, uh, may have gone mistreated. So here's a uh, anterior petrosal meningioma with IAC extension. Can you do this retrosigmoid? Possibly, uh, but look at the anterior extension. It's along the anterior margin of the IAC. So in this situation, I felt it was better to come anterior because then you can get better uh, anterior um, margin. And we were able to excise the dural margin that was on the anterior aspect of the IAC and get this complete removal and, and get 
a gross total here, Simpson grade one. Here's another example. This is a petrous apex meningioma, anterior petrous meningioma, which was located anterior to the IAC. At first glance, you may think a retrosigmoid would be a, a simple approach. But when I looked at the angle of the petrous bone, I noticed that the angle is a little bit more steeper once you get to the tumor. So it would, it would be perhaps challenging to look down this angle around the corner. Um, so I did this through a Kawasi's approach and it was fairly straightforward. Uh, coming from above, it was like removing a convexity meningioma once we were there. And then lastly, this is a, a cholesterol granuloma. Uh, this is one where you drain and we put a tube into the sphenoid sinus between V1 and V2 and we, we hook a, uh, a, a catheter tube that drains it. And this is a 10 years post-op. He's been 10 years recurrence free. You don't have to resect the whole wall. You just merely drain it and provide a pathway of drainage that's continuous. And uh, he did quite well. So I want to um, move on to the uh, extended approaches and to include the posterior patrosal approach. Uh, this is where you include a uh, mastoidectomy and um, go pre-sigmoid. And what this does, it allows you to uh, have more variable angles of attack. It's what Dr. Almefti calls the double patrosal, where you have an anterior patrosal and a retrolab posterior patrosal where you have multiple angles of attack to come pre-sigmoid or subtemporal. And um, here's a case of a recurrent cavernoma. This patient had a retrosigmoid done at another hospital uh, and it recurred. And then they went transclival through the nose uh, to remove it and got a partial removal. And you could see it still recurred. And now this cavernoma uh, has bled again. Uh, patient is now left with uh, what I call the, the straight flush, uh, six, seven, eight uh, palsies with some weakness. And um, it needs to be treated and it needs to be cured. So the lesion comes to the surface right between five and seven, and then it goes a little bit lower beyond that. So my idea here is to come to it, uh, uh, attack it where it comes to the surface, and here's a DVA. We have to preserve this deep venous anomaly to avoid a stroke. So I took his previous retrosigmoid incision and extended it to do a combined patrosal. Uh, we published this video in uh, Neurosurgical Focus. And so you can, you can uh, look online for the full video of this. But uh, we come in subtemporally, just like I showed you. Find the GSPN. Uh, We'll peel off the dura propria subtemporally. And then we'll drill off the uh, Kawasi's triangle, do our anterior petrosectomy. Here's the horizontal petrous carotid. And then we're going to do our mastoidectomy. This is the mastoid portion. You can see here's the incus. Here's the lateral semicircular canal. And once you find the lateral semicircular canal, you can outline and find the crossing posterior semicircular canal. And then here's the superior semicircular canal. There's the otic capsule. And once you skeletonize this, you can now hug the petrous bone and get right on the dura, do a maximal retro labyrinthine exposure. And then we'll go ahead and open up the dura subtemporally, just like I showed you, cut the tentorium, find the fourth nerve, Open up the posterior fossa dura. Ligate the superior patrosal sinus. You're going to see here's the fourth nerve. It's going to come into view right here. There's the fourth nerve. And then here's the fifth nerve. And then we do the pre-sigmoid dural incision, but there's so much scar tissue here that I decided to abort the pre-sigmoid corridor, and then just stick with the subtemporal approach, which ended up to be more than adequate. So here's the cavernoma just located below the fifth nerve. And we're going to remove it in a piecemeal fashion. 
using a little bit of gentle traction and suction sweeping, suction to section to free the cavernoma from the brainstem. This is the exophytic component that's outside of the brainstem. Here you can be a little bit more aggressive. And this is the brainstem. Look how it's hemosiderin stained. We use image guidance to know that there's still cavernoma that's in the actual brainstem as predicted. And we'll make a small corridor, just supra trigeminal corridor here. You can see there's more cavernoma right here that's left behind. It's almost as if it was a cavernoma seeding. And uh, we'll carefully dissect this out in a piecemeal fashion. And then here's the, uh, the surface of the brainstem. Now there was a lot of scar tissue here from previous surgery. Some components of this was quite adherent. So you had to really use sharp dissection here. This is very fibrous, very fibrous uh, scar tissue on the, on the periphery of it. And then here's the DVA. We found the DVA. This is the deep venous anomaly that was on the brainstem. I often like to use the endoscope on these and uh, take a look around the corners. There's the fifth nerve. And then there's inside the brainstem and there's the DVA right here. There's the vein and here's the fourth nerve. And uh, there's the final removal. Here's the double petrosectomy. And here's the post-op scan. You could see a complete removal of the cavernoma. And uh, he did quite well. He recovered from all his previous deficits. And uh, he went on to be a, uh, a motivational speaker, and he's written a book about his experience that you can find on Amazon. Uh, here's a, a petroclival meningioma, a combined patrolsal approach for this. Um, we published this uh, in skull base videos, and um, you could see this was uh, more than adequate to get to this tumor. And the brain stems nicely decompressed. And then we'll do our fascial sling repair that I showed you previously and uh, get a nice complete removal of the tumor here. And so this is the immediate post-op. This is the three month post-op and this is the patient uh, neurologically intact. So a very nice uh, approach for this uh, lesion. This is a, uh, a very cystic appearing uh, enhancing lesion. This ended up to be a, a cystic schwannoma. And uh, we published this video in operative neurosurgery. You can see we've done the retrolabyrinthine petrosectomy and we'll go ahead and cut the tentorium. And when you're cutting the tentorium, you have to be aware of where the vein of LeBay is and uh, protect vein of LeBay. And then of course, protect the fourth nerve like we had mentioned before. We're now gonna open up the arachnoid and release the CSF. And you can see we have a great view of the tumor here, right in the pre-sigmoid corridor. This is the cisternal portion of the trigeminal nerve. So we have the trigeminal nerve identified now. And we'll go ahead and start debulking the tumor. And we can peel the tumor from the brainstem. Here's the brainstem surface. There's the trigeminal nerve. And then here's the seventh and eighth nerve. Look, look down here. This is where seven and eight are located. And so now we have an idea where our safety zones are, which is right between the fifth nerve and the seventh and eighth nerves. We can start to debulk the tumor and start peeling the tumor from the brainstem. Fortunately, these schwannomas tend to be uh, soft and suckable. And so we're able to debulk it with an ultrasonic aspirator. Uh, I'm going to finish the rest of the tentorium cut and open up Meckel's cave like we showed you from before. Then we'll go subtemporal, and um, we only use intermittent retraction only when we're getting to the most superior portion of it, and it's just a temporary uh, retraction. You can see the fourth nerve was there, and now we can open up Meckel's cave and take out the rest of the tumor that's here in Meckel's cave. And there's the tumor inferior to the fifth nerve. Now, what's vulnerable here is the sixth nerve. This is always the dip most difficult part on these petroclival lesions is where is the sixth nerve? 
And typically these are usually the most medial structure right next to the basilar. So you have to slow down your pace and, and be, be mindful to look for it. And here's the, here's the brainstem. We're taking out the last portion of the tumor here. And uh, there's the sixth nerve here. You can see there's a little tiny residue of tumor adherent to the sixth nerve. There's the basilar artery. And this is the view with the endoscope looking in. You can see there's the brainstem and here's the sixth nerve. Here's the basilar. And here's the seven and eight with a small tumor adherence there. And so here's the post-op scan, a, a near total removal, but excellent brainstem compression. And this is a recent case I did last week. This is uh, reminiscent of the first case I showed you of my limits of retrosigmoid. And what I learned from that first case was that the retrosigmoid did not allow me to look behind this corner and to look backwards on the brainstem. And so since I learned from that, we decided to go ahead and do this upfront with a retro, uh, a uh, trans patrosal, combined patrosal approach with a uh, retro sigmoid option. So here's the petrosectomy, combined patrosal with a retro sigmoid exposure. We initially make our pre-sigmoid dural opening this is all infratentorial. You can see this is the epidermoid tumor. Here's the fifth nerve. And here we're taking out portions of this epidermoid. There's the brainstem. And the beauty of this is that I can look backwards on the cerebellum. So you see the cerebellar surface is here and it's quite adherent. This area. I'm looking right in front of the cerebellum. This is an area that's going to be your blind spot retrosigmoid. And I can peel this tumor that's right on that surface of the cerebellum. And I can find all the cranial nerves here as I'm peeling the tumor off of the front of the cerebellum. I'm working in front of the cerebellum. And you cannot do this with a retrosigmoid approach. There's the uh, a branch of the basilar. Now this basilar had a lot of uh, perforators with tumor uh, cyst wall adherent to it. So you have to preserve these perforators. We leave little microscopic remnants of the cyst wall adherent to it. Now I'm gonna go retrosigmoid. So I have the option of coming in retrosigmoid and this is the limits of my transpatrosal. I wasn't able to see this portion of it down low, down by, uh, 9 and 10 and, and 12 nerves. So I'm able to get down low. And then here's the lower cranial nerves you see here. And you can see the tumor cyst wall is very adherent to these nerves. This is the seventh and eighth nerve complex. I'm peeling the tumor off of seven and eight. Seven and eight are now free. And you can see just the, uh, the meticulous dissection that's involved to remove as much of the cyst wall as possible. Look at, this is a basilar perforator. I'm preserving this perforator and removing as much cyst wall as possible. This is the final view. This is the basilar. Here's the sixth nerve. This is seven and eight. And then this is the defect, which we repair with the fascia lata. And then this is the complete removal post-op scan. We left a little microscopic residue of cyst wall on the basilar perforators. But this is a, an example of using the combined patrosal. Now, there's different variations of the patrosal. What I've shown you so far is the retro lab. This is what allows you to do hearing preservation, but you can remove the superior and posterior canals and still preserve hearing potentially. This is called the transcrucial approach. And if your hearing is gone, you can use a trans lab and get the full exposure. And lastly, the, the, uh, if you mobilize the facial nerve posteriorly, you can drill off the cochlea and do a transcochlear approach. And this gives you the maximal exposure. Uh, we rarely do this variant uh, anymore because this uh, typically results in a facial nerve palsy that only recovers to as good as a Brackman 3. So 
when we're doing the transcrucial approach, you drill off the superior and posterior canals, and you have to wax off the ampulated ends. So you want to minimize loss of the uh, uh, semicircular canal uh, endolymph. So this is an example where I used uh, this transcrucial approach. You can see this is a very large uh, petroclival meningioma with Meckel's cave extension. So if I did this through a simple retrosigmoid approach, it would not be so simple. I mean, look how much brainstem uh, cerebellar retraction, you would have a difficult time seeing this most medial corner of, of the brainstem and to be able to control it and to peel it versus where I can come in at this angle through a Kawasi and a pre-sigmoid transcrucial approach. And this is what we published recently called the, what I call the CTAP, the Combined Transcrucial Anterior Petrosal Approach for the petroclival. Here we've already done our petrosectomy. We've done our transcrucial petrosectomy. This is the uh, vein of LeBay. So we'll cut around the vein of LeBay to preserve it. We'll ligate the superior petrosal sinus. And we'll cut the rest of the tentorium here and start debulking the tumor. You can see we're working all above the seventh and eighth nerves. This is the seventh uh, and eighth nerves here. And the tumor is going to be superiorly to it. Here's the lower cranial nerves after we've opened up the arachnoid. But the working corridor here is all above seven. And we'll debulk the tumor. And here's the fifth nerve smashed against the brainstem. And we'll start to peel the tumor from the brainstem. And then follow the fifth nerve up into Meckel's cave. There's the basilar artery. Nice view of the basilar. And we'll open up Meckel's cave by opening up this fibrous ring of the tentorium. There's the tumor, soft tumor in Meckel's cave that we're removing. And then the last portion of this is the most difficult part. This is the subtemporal part, and we want to be looking out for the fourth nerve. And fortunately, this tumor was soft uh, and not too fibrous. So we were able to bring this down by incising the arachnoid that's holding the tumor together. And once you incise the arachnoid, you can mobilize the tumor down. And you'll see here the fourth nerve starts to come into view. There's the fourth nerve coming into view. And so we can follow it, follow the fourth nerve. And then there's the sixth nerve here on the on the other side. And then dissect it from the SCA branch. Here's the SCA branch. Looking for all the arachnoid adhesions. And then here using a single blade technique of the micro scissors as a dissector, freeing up these arachnoid adhesions and eventually delivering the last portion of tumor. Here's the final view. You can see beautiful view of the lower cranials and the fifth nerve. This is the fascial sling technique. And this was a, uh, a radical near total and we were able to preserve the hearing and keep the facial nerve intact. So, so a good, a good approach. Now, I'm just going to give you a tasting of uh, my upcoming topic, which is on craniocervical junction. But this is an example of how you use temporal bone for jugular foramen tumors. Okay, we published this some time ago. This is the technique I've adopted from uh, Dr. Fukushima. This is an infralabyrinthine anterolateral approach. You get great control of the jugular foramen. And uh, this is an excellent approach for jugular frame and tumors. This is a patient who had uh, cranial nerves 9 through 12 palsies. You could see there's hemiatrophy of the tongue and there's a uh, winging of the scapula from 11th nerve palsy. You could see this is the tumor at the craniocervical junction that's compressing the brainstem severely. 
but on careful study, you could see this is actually also in the parapharyngeal space, and it's invading the jugular foramen, which is causing the patient's cranial nerve palsies. This is a chordoma. This is a chordoma that's eroded the clivus, invaded the jugular foramen, and caused occipital cervical instability. And so we'll do this through a lateral approach. This is a transmastoid infralabyrinthine transjugular approach. And so what you're going to see here is this is drilling of the mastoid, skeletonizing the sigmoid sinus. This is the occipital condyle or what's left of it. This is all tumor uh, replacing the occipital condyle. This is V3 segment of the vertebral artery. And we're going to do a fallopian bridge technique where we drill and skeletonize the facial nerve. And we're going to tie off the internal jugular vein and open up the sigmoid sinus and then use endoluminal occlusion technique with a piece of gel foam and then inject surgiflow distally to control back bleeding from the inferior petrosal sinus. And what this does is it controls the jugular venous system so it's not bleeding and I can now take out the tumor in the jugular bulb. This is chordoma in the jugular bulb. And now I'm gonna attack the chordoma in the peripharyngeal space. We're retracting the carotid arteries laterally. This is all tumor in the uh, neck and we'll debulk the tumor and then excise the jugular vein uh, that's involved with tumor. And then we're gonna drill off the rest of the occipital condyle. This is like a, a loose tooth. And then once we drill that off, we can access the C12 space. And then we'll drill off the inferior clivus. This is the, the remnant of the inferior clivus where the tumor had eroded. So we're gonna polish this bone to get rid of the tumor cells in the inferior clivus. This is the tip of the odontoid. And now we can drill off the tip of the odontoid and then remove all of the extradural tumor before going now intradurally. This is the brainstem. This is the vertebral artery, vertebral artery. We're going to control the brainstem and vertebral artery, and all of the tumor is going to be anterior. This is the lower cranial nerves, which are all dysfunctional. So we're going to divide these and then debulk the rest of the tumor that's ventral to the brainstem and excise this dura. And there's the vertebral basilar junction. Brainstem is decompressed. Large dural defect. These are very challenging to repair. We use an alloderm uh, patch uh, graft and occlude the middle ear to prevent CSF fistula. And then we'll use a, a large fat graft here and a medpor plate for reconstruction. So this is the pre-op, this is the post-op. And we did a, uh, a third stage uh, occipital cervical fusion uh, and he did quite well from this. So uh, in conclusion, I think the retrosigmoid is the workhorse for posterior fossa, but I think to increase your skull base game, you got to know all the alternate approaches to the posterior fossa. And these include the transpetrosal approaches because they really give you multiple angles of attack and they can sometimes provide you more advantages uh, to desired targets. And, and we can master the temporal bone, just like uh, an archaeologist or Michelangelo. And I thank you for this time, and I'm happy to take any questions at this time. Thank you very much, Dr. Liu, for this amazing lecture. Uh, if anyone has any comments or questions for Dr. Liu. Thank you, Professor James. Uh, it was a very high yield lecture. Uh, we have Professor Atul going with us. I think we don't need to speak before him. Welcome, Professor. The king is here. <laughs> yes. Oh, no, Dr. Liu, I must say that I enjoyed the presentation. And I have to also say that nowadays I don't go to too many, I don't attend too many webinars, but this, I made it a point to attend your webinar, James. And uh, needless to say that you have achieved a very high level of sophisticated microneurosurgical techniques, the art of dissection, dissection of the tumor, the art of getting the exposure, are no mean achievements in your young career. 
and I wish you a very fantastic long career in this field of skull based surgery and in the field of temporal bone drilling and temporal bone dissection, the triangles that you talk about, the uh, nerves and bones and artery and all those things you talk about in the temporal brain are not easy to master. Most important thing I, I understand in skull-based surgery is your experience. More and more and more tumors that you operate, more and more experience you get and what you are demonstrating is a very high-end skull-based surgery. And uh, I was very happy to see the various things that you showed. If you really want to ask about my comment on your lecture, is that over the number of years that I have been in skull-based surgery, my exposures have a little bit reduced to when compared to your exposures. And uh, that does not mean anything, but I feel that I have been hanging, having the hang of these tumors a little bit in my 35, 40 years of skull-based surgery, like tumors of trigeminal neurinomas, tumors, pitoclival meningiomas, epidermoid tumors in the region. Epidermoid tumors are one of the most beautiful tumors in their looks and beautiful tumors to operate. How much you remove, how much you should remove, and how to remove are lessons that we learn over several years of dealing with these tumors, over several tumors that you will operate in your career. Trigeminal neurinoma, for instance, are very beautiful skull-based tumors. And uh, how to save the trigeminal nerve fibers, how to save the V1 division of the trigeminal nerve. It is so important, James, as you have realized in your own series that you have presented, V1 division of the trigeminal nerve. If you lose V1, you lose the corneal sensation and you lose your eye. So it may just be better not to operate on trigeminal neurinoma rather than damaging the V1 division of trigeminal nerve. So it is important, critically important to save the fibers, understand the trigeminal neurinoma, understand the implications of damaging the V1 division in particular, and other sensory nerves of the facial nerve and motor nerve. Learn the art of breaking the tumor. Learn the art of dissecting in the subarachnoid plane. All these tumors have different surgical philosophies as we have seen. Chordomas in particular. How much to remove chordoma? How much is the possibility of removing chordomas? how much drilling is necessary, whether we can leave tumor behind, whether we can be aggressively pursuing complete resection or large resection of these tumors are lessons that we have to learn in our subject of neurosurgery over several years with several tumors. All in all, I have to say that uh, Dr. Liu is one of the leaders in skull-based surgery and one of the promising prospect in the field. And there is no word other than my best wishes to him and to his emerged, not emerging, but emerged level in the field of neurosurgery in general, skull-based surgery in particular. My best wishes to you, Dr. Liu. Thank you, Professor Goel. Those are uh, tremendously kind words and kind words of encouragement. And I want to thank you for over the years of, you know, your great experience. And, you know, my generation learned from all of the contributions that you've uh, published over the decades. And um, uh, we've learned greatly from your experience. And, uh, you know, thank you for being, you know, one of our great teachers in Sculby surgery. Thanks, Atul. Thank the king has spoken. <laughs> can, can I ask a, a small technical question or just sure. uh, to, to get uh, to share, actually, to get James to share a little bit his technical knowledge? When we have these benign tumors, we have all these membranes around them. Arachnoid, you just uh, mentioned this perineural, 
Professor Cole is very famous for pointing out the dural envelopes of such tumors. And it is very, very important to, to find those planes. Now, can you share with us a little bit your technical tricks? Uh, for example, I, I, I like to use hooks. I, look, uh, I sometimes don't trust the micro scissors. I, I rather use a blade. What, what is your experience there? And, and what is the role of maybe not using too much bipolar or using more or uh, just elaborate a little bit on getting these planes right? Thank you. That's a, that's a great question. Um, I, I think what I've learned over the years in evolution, this is a work in progress, of course, but is the concept of undressing the tumor. You know, you have the true tumor capsule and it's ensheathed by a lot of membranes. You know, a lot of times it's the arachnoid and in you know, a lot of times it's arachnoid that will protect the cranial nerves and the surrounding vessels. And of course, the surfaces of the brain, like the brainstem. So if you can undress that membrane, that clear membrane, which is in most cases the arachnoid, uh, that arachnoid will fall towards the side of the brainstem and the, the, the vessels and cranial nerves. So you can protect those surfaces and then remove the tumor. And in some cases of these petroclival meningiomas, that tumor, especially on the pre-op T2, if you see cobblestoning of the brainstem, you know that there's going to be possibly some peel invasion. And you have to be a little bit more conservative when you get to the brainstem surface. But if you begin working in that plane, that's when you can trim the tumor and i i like to use scissors technically when i'm doing this is i use a you know i use a a, a nice pair of uh, charmant scissors is what i use in my tray and this has a very nice recoil on the scissors when you open so i can spread so i do a lot of spreading and cutting and then i use the suction if i'm going to trim the level of the brainstem and leave the smallest carpet on the on the brainstem I use the suction to vacuum the tumor upwards so it holds it under traction and then just use the blades of the scissors to trim it. So I leave a little residue on whatever structure I need to, um, similar to what you saw on that epidermoid tumor where I, I had to leave the, the membranes stuck to the basilar perforators. Um, but that's the technique I use. You can use a combination. I, I have used an arachnoid knife on some some scar tissue to release the tumor from critical structures as well. Um, but I like to use the scissors and suction. So it means you work in a place where they have really very nice micro scissors. <laughs> because often we find that somebody has used them on some very hard material and then the tips which you really want to use don't really cut and so on. Uh, yes, I, I think that that's very valuable. What about picking up things? You, you talk about spreading. You need proper forcepses to hold these fibers, to hold them up so you can divide them. So what about that? What, what are you using there? Are you using the sucker only in, in the depths of uh, the field or are you using other techniques? Yeah, I, I use the suction to pick up things, but in some instances, I use very fine micro bayoneted forceps. And I think if you you have, have a good assistant who can help you using three hands technique, that can free you up to, to either pick up or use a suction as well. But I, I agree, uh, fine forceps are, are very important to help pick up things. Actually, I, I found that the turbate forceps, because of their kind of... Um... Uh, the, the way that the cross, uh, you know, the the tip of the forceps has these cross sectioned. Uh, it's not not just simple parallel or uh, perpendicular to the axis of the actual uh, forceps tip. They are very good, even though they look a little bit rough. You can pick up the finest things with them. Uh, have you? Are you using them at all? Um, what kind of forceps were these that you mentioned? Uh, the bakey, you know, the vascular, uh, they're, they're commonly known as, as vascular, um, what do they call them again? Uh, vascular pickups, I guess. Uh, the bakey, the named after this uh, okay. Lebanese Texan uh, researcher. 
They're very common. Yeah, I, I probably don't use actual debate keys, um, I, but I'll use in some instances, some, some instances, uh, jeweler forceps that are very fine or um, fine micro bayoneted forceps. Right. Yeah. Probably. But, but, yeah. Do you find all the all the instruments on the Roton set useful, or do you have certain preferences? Um, I I sometimes will use the uh, the Roton three of various sizes, the disc dissector, uh, a spatulated Roton six, and then I like to use a, a sharp hook, and then the blunt ball tip hook for areas I don't want to injure, and then. Um, I like to use the Fukushima Ichiban. It's like a bayoneted ball tip dissector, which I think is useful. And then a, a McElveen knife, uh, which is a, it's an angled hook that has a ball tip at the end, but it has a blade on the hook. So you can, you can incise things as you lift. Right, these kind of uh, special uh, cutting hooks are being used these days to dissect off the pituitary from its lateral attachments when people endoscopically want to go um, displace the pituitary gland, isn't it? So they're very useful as well. Well, thank you for sharing this with, with me and with everyone else. I hope I uh, enlightened a little bit because it, I think the devil is really in the detail. The approaches and the planning are obviously very, very important. And congratulations for all the, the beautiful classical work that you have done. But um, when it comes to dealing with the lesions, we still have to uh, remember all these details, I guess. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. We have a question uh, from Dr. Gadam. It says that any role of the lumbar drain preoperatively? Uh, yes, I, I think lumbar drain is useful when I'm um, doing Kawasi approach or petrosal approaches, um, you know, you have to make sure the temporal lobe is nicely relaxed, uh, so you can mobilize it. So I always like to have the drain in place and we usually will leave it, uh, post-op, uh, in the event that I leave it clamped usually post-op and then I open it selectively if, you know, I suspect there might be a pseudomeningocele issue, but if there's no issue, I'll remove it after a day or two. Okay, before we wrap up, uh, we have Professor Abida Shah, we have Professor Porhani and Professor uh, Harshad. If uh, they have any contribution, we'll, we will be happy to listen. Hello. Hi, James. Hi, Hassan. Yeah, James, excellent uh, demonstration of the various approaches you have mastered. As my dear friend Atul says, you are really doing a great job and I'm following your, all the lectures very carefully and very diligently and learning a lot from you. And uh, excellent uh, way of doing petrosectomy and causes approach and combined approaches. You uh, and your study of anatomy is superb, no doubt about it. A couple of things which uh, I was thinking, uh, the small tumors which you see near the Mikkel scale, whether it is a meningioma or uh, whether they are trigeminal neurinoma, uh, would you like to observe those cases or you like to operate even if you, you know, they are very small tumors? You have shown a couple of cases. Yeah, that's a great question. I, I think if you encounter a small tumor and the patient is asymptomatic, you know, we'll yeah. generally offer a trial of observation and to wait and scan. And if there's any interval growth, I think, mm -hmm. uh, or, or if they become symptomatic, I think, you know, the indication becomes more clear. You can, you know, treat them surgically or if they refuse surgery, mm -hmm. radio surgery is always an option if it's, okay. if it's a small tumor. Especially the case where you were thinking that somebody said it is in cavernous sinus and it was not in cavernous sinus, you know, similar kind of lesion. In my experience, I've got quite a few patients which are either trigeminal neurinoma or even the meningiomas in last so many years. And we are following up since last 10 years, 12 years. And 
they are not symptomatic as of now they may become but they are not growing so the thought was that whether they really grow over a period of time this was my thought wonderful your techniques are wonderful and uh, as dr martin was saying about the debecky's forceps they are more or less like a jewelers forceps only they are exactly like jewelers forceps and what they call them as a vascular forceps they are more or less same there no change I means i have seen both and i find the names are different but they are the same forceps which most of the people who does the uh, skull base work they are using for the dissecting the arachnoids or maybe from the even in many cases of extradural even we are doing those forceps are very helpful wonderful but i like your technique of a one prong scissors to dissect it out i've yeah, seen well, this this technique in with the professor lindsay simon in uk yeah. he used to do this scissor dissection of aneurysms you know all the arachnoids with us and super yeah. Yeah. but this is good good technique yes dr martin yes okay, andrew yeah, well, andrew you have a question there Andrea? Yes. Uh, it says in the chat about the alternative of draining a CSF from the civil seizure before opening, uh, before this subtemporal approach. What do you think about this instead of like uh, doing the lumbar drain with all family two complications after that? Yeah. Um, I think that's certainly uh, uh, a possible method uh, if your exposure includes the sylvian fissure so if you did a frontotemporal with a kawasi you can do that um but generally i'm just doing more middle fossa exposure so i don't have the sylvian fissure you know within my craniotomy so um i generally use the lumbar drain but you can also drill from the um i'm sorry you can also drain csf uh from the uh, posterior fossa dura, uh, as you're drilling the Kawasi's triangle, you can open the dura and, and drill CSF uh, early on. That's another, that's another uh, technique you can do so that uh, if you don't have a lumbar drain. Okay, thank you very much. Also, uh, Dr. Ibrahina is asking about after drilling the ICA, do you use the muscle to close the hole or glue the red patch? The, you mean drilling the internal auditory canal, not drilling yes, the yes. internal carotid artery? Yes. Yeah, so after yes, drilling- professor. Sorry. Okay. Yes, professor, is uh, the internal auditory. Like uh, if you drill it after you finish uh, removing the tumor, do you often use the muscle or the dura patch to glue to close it to prevent yeah. the leak? That, that's a great question. So when we're doing acoustic neuroma surgery, we'll often drill the internal auditory canal. And what I do is I use an endoscope afterwards to inspect the drilling to see if there's any air cells. And if there's any air cells, that is what causes a CSF fistula. So you have to close off the air cells with bone wax. So after I close with bone wax, I'll use a uh, hydroset cement, which is uh, a layer of cement to reconstruct the ice, IAC. And then we'll use either fat or muscle to put right around the arc of the IAC. You have to be careful not to let the cement or the graft material fall on the facial nerve. So you have to protect the facial nerve with uh, a little bit of a, a, a collagen sponge or like a bicol or even a gel foam. So as you're applying these uh, grafts, they don't fall on the facial nerve. And then once the, the graft is on, we use a little bit of Surgicel and fibrin glue, fibrin glue. And then once that's done, then you can take the gel foam out and re-inspect the facial nerve, make sure it's okay. But you don't want any of that material falling on the facial nerve and, and causing irritation. But these are important things to do to close off the any petrous air cells to prevent CSF fistula. 
Okay. And uh, how about the, the CP angle? angle? Usually because of the, the leak is always present. Do you often like use the artificial dero or you use the fat to close it uh, tightly, water tightly? Or what do yeah. you say about that? That's a great question. So for retro sigmoid, in most cases, I can I use a C-shaped dural incision and you can close that in most cases uh, as opposed to a cruciate incisions, which are very difficult to get watertight closure. And if you need a little patch, you can use a little bit of muscle or fat. Uh, we published a paper some years ago using a fat that we put right over the suture line on the retro sigmoid. And then we put a plate over the craniectomy defect to put pressure on the suture line. And that's been very effective in preventing CSF leak in retrosigmoid. For the transpetrosal approaches, the defect of the dura is larger. So I like to use autologous fascia lata, which is very good tissue. And you can put that right over the dural defect and you can suture it on. Lately, we've also been using taco seal, which is a special fiber and sealant. And that's been very useful as well to uh, help seal down the, the fascia lata or, or even to close a small dural defect. And then you can augment it with some fat graft and the pericranial flap uh, as a multi-layered repair. The thing you have to be careful of on the petrosal approaches is at the end of the surgery, the temporal lobe is sagging. And you can be easily fooled into filling the dead space with a bunch of fat graft. That's, that's a mistake. And what will happen is that you'll get excessive temporal lobe uh, compression post-op because once you close the, the craniotomy and the patient goes to recovery, that temporal lobe re-expands rather quickly. And if you fill the dead space with a lot of fat, you're going to cause temporal lobe compression and possible herniation. So be very careful to minimize any kind of subtemporal or extra temporal compression. Thank you, Professor, for this uh, knowledgeable presentation. Really appreciate it and I enjoy it. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else has any questions or comments to Dr. Liu? Well, no, not really, but uh, coming back to what Dr. Harsha said, you know, there is a school in France for acoustics where they actually use two forcepses. And they use these two forcepses to just get onto the same membrane that uh, Dr. Liu called the perineural one. And then they pick them up both and they separate them. And in doing so, um, you get uh, a very nice plane and it works beautifully and it, my objection sometimes to the scissors is that the scissors tend to squeeze and pinch things that unless they're properly picked up and properly identified you, you might not really want to squeeze and pinch and cut but uh, having said that, often, you know, the, the art of neurosurgery in this is, is really to be working in a very confined space and just get used to it and, and be patient and, and, and anyone can eventually master it, I believe. Yes. So thank you again for your beautiful work. And uh, that, that was my comment. Okay. Thank you very yeah. much, Doctor, for your comment. For all your discussion, this has been an amazing Saturday start with Dr. Liu's lecture. Thank you very much for sharing your knowledge and your experience with us, Dr. Liu. Great. Yeah, thank you very much, Jane. Very interactive. Great session. Thank you. Thank uh, you, Dan. And, 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 and next week, uh, in two weeks, we're going to have another yes. webcast. Do we have a title yet for that uh, presentation, James? Uh, not quite, but I have a few ideas. I'll, I'll send them over to you. Okay. Okay. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Thanks, Andrea, for running the show. And thanks, Mohammed, Martin, Harshad, uh, and Dr. Goel, the king, for all coming. And we'll see you in two weeks. See you. Bye.